Thank you very much and thank you uh, for inviting me and I'm excited and honoured to be here. I'm not quite sure what your expectations are of me and I'm not quite sure of what my expectations are of you and hopefully our expectations will meet in the middle. But, but, the, but the aim of this talk is that you enjoy it and hopefully learn something new. So let's um, go through the outline so you just get a sense of where we're going. IP context, my perspective of things, the Latvian usage of the IP system, some fundamentals, licensing and assignment, startup and spin out companies, collaborations, joint ventures and mergers and acquisitions. That's the sort of big picture that we'll be looking at. And um, I guess surprisingly to me when I looked, when I did this talk, I looked at the IP context that one can consider. And you can see IP policy, the impact of IP on economics, the commercial context that we'll be talking about, litigation, competition, social, environmental, valuation, feminist, Marxist. Those last two surprised me a little bit in terms of the relevance of intellectual property. But as you can see, there's a whole range of elements that intellectual property can um, impact on. So far as the commercial contexts are concerned. Again, there's a broad range there. I've talked about licensing and assignment. I don't know the extent to which you've dealt with licensing or assignment or spin out companies, etc. But we'll be going to the, as far as uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, for any of you who are interested in IP holding companies, um, they're not as straightforward as one might think. It's not just a matter of holding IP in one company, there are tax issues, there are administration issues, etc. But we won't be going through those. So you can see in terms of the commercial context, all these areas, the share sale agreement, IP holding companies, employment contracts, structured finance, security for loan arrangements, insolvency, franchising, collecting societies, and as Adam mentioned before, the management of intellectual property, where I gave a talk at the University of Warsaw strategy as well. So all of those elements are important. The commercial context is one aspect, but being commercial is the other aspect. And being commercial means knowing what your options are. And being commercial means knowing what the law is in order to understand what those options are. And when you know those options, transaction costs of doing the deal are likely to be lowered. Because one of the things that, that I certainly experienced in law practice was that doing a, a commercial deal with intellectual property can be a very expensive, can be a very expensive uh, thing. And therefore, knowing what your options are in advance um, makes it much easier for, for you to understand the path that you have to go down. Ultimately, I hope, as I've said at the beginning of the talk, that you enjoy it and learn something that you perhaps hadn't learnt before. So going to my perspective. Um, unsurprisingly, it's principally a Western common law statutes perspective. Transactions involving both Australian and non-Australian parties. I have no knowledge of Latvian law, although I do have a bit of a go later on. And if I'm wrong, please apolo I, I apologise. So the knowledge that I assume of the commercial context, I guess, is an assumption that I make is that it's similar to the master's students that I taught at the University of New South Wales. So let's go through where we are. My assessment of the uh, Latvian IP system is that it's not a high usage system. You don't use the IP system a lot, and that's based on the WIPO rankings that I got. So WIPO rankings of total residents and abroad filings activity by origin in 2020. And as you can see, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, they're very much um, in one group although Latvia uh, appears third in the patents and trademarks and first in designs. I don't know what your experience is like and whether that reflects that experience and whether there's an update of that since I looked on 
uh, since I looked that information up. But again, it shows that it's a low intensity IP usage, whether that's good, bad or indifferent, I'm not gonna make a comment about because I don't know the nature of, uh, of the economic system here. Um, I think it's very important to understand the fundamentals. If you understand the fundamentals of what we're going to be dealing with, then it's going to be a lot easier to deal with a transaction or deal with a deal. And the first fundamental is terminology. So there's a lot of terminology that's used in the context of intellectual property. There's intellectual property, there's intellectual capital, there's intellectual assets, there's intangible property and there's intangible assets. And each of these terms can have a different meaning. Intellectual property can mean those rights created or enforced by law to protect certain outcomes of human knowledge from unauthorised use by others. But some statutes in Australia go beyond that to include business names. And business names usually wouldn't be included in intellectual property. Intellectual capital can mean knowledge that can be converted to value. Intellectual assets can mean ideas that have been codified in some manner. Intangible assets typically have an accounting meaning which includes contractual rights. And if you look at the International Accounting Standard 38, that's where that comes from. Intangible property is usually considered in similar terms to, in in to intangible assets. These terms can be used um, interchangeably, but you've got to be very careful as to what use you're actually making in your deal. Whether you're talking about intellectual property, intellectual capital, make sure that in the context of what you're dealing with, you define correctly and properly what you want to deal with. So the other thing, or the next fundamental, is that different concepts underlie the different types of intellectual property. Copyright protects the form of expression of ideas and not ideas themselves. Design registration protects the appearance of products, not their function. Patents protect inventive products and processes, the function, not ideas. Trademark registration protects distinctive signs. And confidential information protects ideas not in the public domain. So if you were expecting to, to um, see some sort of harmony between these generally accepted areas of intellectual property, there is none, okay? So that's an Im important thing to learn for a start. Um, going on to the next fundamental, and that is a different treatment of the same issue within, within a jurisdiction. So in Australia, for instance, the meaning of exclusive licensee for patents and copyright is not the same. Don't assume that they are. Different treatments for the same issues. Again, I'd look at exclusive licensees between jurisdictions such as Australia, uh, the United Kingdom and Latvia. And you'll see that, that the way that they're treated is differently in each jurisdiction. So the fundamental point again is don't assume that just because something is defined or dealt with in one manner within a particular statute in your jurisdiction that it's going to be dealt with in the same manner in another jurisdiction. The next fundamental is registered versus non-registrable subject matter. So you know, for instance, that patents are registrable. There is a system to register the patent register. Copyright, there's no such thing. Registered trademarks, there is in, in, certainly in the common law area, there are common law marks that arise because of usage. That's a big difference between registration and non-registration. Another fundamental is the substantive examination versus no substantive examination. So in Australia, in order to get a patent, there is a substantive examination of the application. There is no substantive examination of the design and that only occurs after certain events. So you don't assume that something is a registered design unless it's gone through that process. Another fundamental is property. Um, Patents are property. Patent applications are not property in Australia. Property versus not property is important in the context of subject that is property can be mortgaged, can be left in a will, 
has capital gains tax implications. And again, in the context of what we're talking about, you need to understand that there's a difference between subject matter that is property and subject matter that is not. And by and large, certainly in the Australian context, applications for registration are not property. It's only property once it's registered, granted, etc. Um, another fundamental is that there are two ways to deal with intellectual property. Assignment, that is transfer, licensing, that is uh, granting someone rights. And another feature of intellectual property is its divisibility. Divisibility as to rights, as to ge geography, as to time, as to field of, ex uh, of activity, as to extent. That gives rise to a lot of flexibility, but it also gives rise to a lot of complexity as well. So for instance, in the context of something being divisible, an intellectual property right being divisible, you may have an exclusive license in Australia for 10 years to adapt a novel into a film script. If you look at a physical item, a chair or a desk, that's not possible to be dealt with in this manner. You can't divide it in geography, rights, time, etc. All of those elements can't be done in terms of a physical asset. Another important element in the context of fundamental is that payment does not necessarily result in ownership. So certainly in the context of copyright law in Australia, what you need to do is if you pay somebody for the relevant right, you need to get a physical assignment of copyright. The fact that you pay does not mean that you get the right. So if you have that concept in your mind, payment does not necessarily give rise to ownership. It's an important consideration when you're talking about any deal that you're dealing with. So the next fundamental is that IP and services are two sources of payment. So for instance, if you have a patent license, part of that patent license will be the, be the royalty that may be paid or an upfront fee that may be paid. But another part could be a service component so that the license could provide that one of the licensor's scientists or whoever is supplied as a service. So there are two income streams that can be obtained. Don't think of um, this area purely in terms of one income stream. Services can be another income stream. Um, the next fundamental is international uh, access, risks and benefits. Treaties can give rise to rights in foreign jurisdictions. So for instance, the Berne Convention and copyright, and they give rise to timing priorities for applications, Paris Convention for trademarks and trademark applications. Now that has um, implications in terms of a benefit for someone that, that files in a Paris Convention company. They have six months within which to file their trademark. But there's a problem if, uh, if someone files a, a trademark application in the US and there's a six month lag, they're entitled to file in Australia. The searchability of that mark in Australia is a problem. So there are always risks and benefits in the context of um, the international arrangements that, uh, that exist in the context of intellectual property. We're near the end of the fundamentals and uh, um, it's important to understand, at least in a common law context, that you can deal with intellectual property both at law and in equity. Now, I, I doubt that there's a separation in Latvia. There might be. Um, it would be important for you to understand that if you were dealing with a common law jurisdic jurisdiction. And finally, in terms of searching, um, not all searches for registered and registrable rights are the same. You can have an ownership search, a validity search, a registrability search, an infringement search, a registration search, a prior art search, security interest search, you must understand what you're asking and that searching can be difficult exercise, which is not foolproof. And I guess one of the important elements to understand in the context of searching is it's a technical exercise. It's not as if someone can just look up a book and say X or Y. Now, uh, an interesting example that, that I was confronted with, I was acting for a buyer 
in, in the context of a large merger and acquisition, and the patents were a very significant component of that acquisition. So we did an ownership search and an infringement search in the context of the vendors, the sellers' patents. And what we found was that the vendor did in fact own the patents, which was fine, but all the patents infringed someone else's patents. And you can imagine that finding that out was quite a surprise. And what that led to was a negotiation about the price. So the price went from there down to there. So it's important to understand what type of searches you're going to be doing and being involved in. Let me just take a sip. So um, the key point there is this, understanding the fundamentals will provide a solid framework for dealing with IP in commercial context, but beware of local variations. So, all I'm suggesting to you is this, if you consider all those aspects in the context of whatever deal you're doing, one or all of those aspects will have an impact on your deal. And if it makes you think about something that's significant in your deal, then I think that's been important. Now, going on to licensing. Um, have any of you dealt with any uh, licensing deals, just as a matter of interest? Any? Yes, you've dealt with some. What, what did you license? Patents, copyrights, trademarks? Uh, mostly trademarks. Mostly trademarks, okay. Well, I, I think that an important element in the context of licensing uh, is just knowing what factors impact on licensing. And all those factors mean that there's no such thing as a standard licensing agreement. So you've got the industry requirements and, uh, and practices. So here I give an example of the pharmaceutical industry versus the mining industry, the software industry versus a publishing industry. Context is also an important element. Context meaning if you're dealing with an arm's length commercial deal, that's one thing. But if you're dealing with a pre or post litigation scenario, that's another thing. There's a different bargaining situation that arises in that context. The s subject matter that arises in the context of those deals is different research tools, platform technologies, single product applications, literary works, trademarks. The next thing is the maturity of development of the particular subject matter, whether it's early stage, close to market, and final product. So you can imagine in the context of an early stage product that the price of that license is probably going to be lower. The nearer it gets to market, the price of that license is going to get higher. And again, the rights that attach to each of these uh, forms of subject matter are different. So in the context of copyright, you get a right to reproduce, at least amongst those rights, re reproduction, adaptation. In the context of patents, in Australia, it's a right to exploit, which includes a right to sell, offer for sale, etc., etc. The important element here is this though. So again, I go back to an example of mine. One of my partners um, was doing a mergers and acquisitions deal and said to me, I want your standard license agreement. And I, I eventually convinced him that there's no such thing as a standard license agreement, identify, identifying in the context of what we've just been talking about, all the elements that can impact on a license arrangement. So, Whilst there's no such thing as a standard license agreement, licenses do follow a typical format and contain typical content adapted to the commercial deal and jurisdictions. So if you're ever asked to either supply a standard trademark license agreement, a standard copyright license agreement, just balk at that and try and explain to whoever has asked that to you that that's not the way it's dealt with. You've got to get the facts of the commercial deal in order to prepare a license. Now, what is a license? Can I ask you, what is a license? Any, any, sorry? To use a product, okay. Okay, any, anyone else have another view of that? Sorry? A driving license. Well, you, you can leave the room. <laughs> a license to kill. A license to kill, okay. 
Excellent, excellent. Because there is an issue in the context of the law as to what a license is. And um, I can, so a license is usually viewed as a permission. A permission granted by the owner of an intellectual property right to another party to do something that the owner is entitled to do arising from the rights granted to the owner by law. Now, do you then know what the difference is between a license and technology transfer? Property rights, I think, perhaps. Uh, by technology transfer, you are transferring perhaps property rights, but uh, by licensing, you are obtaining the permission to use something. Not quite, because the, the acquisition aspect is an assignment of the rights. So a technology transfer usually comprises something more than a patent license. So usually a patent license accompanied by some other subject matter, whether it's know-how, whether it's equipment, it's something else other than a patent license, other than the licensing of the rights. Then the last thing I'll ask you about was, or is, what is a covenant not to sue? Have you ever heard of that concept? No? So it's a very interesting concept and um, some people view it as a license. Some people view it as not being a license. So the, the whole concept of a license is you're granted permission, you grant someone permission. A covenant not to sue is the negative of that. I won't sue you because I've, I, I won't sue you and that's, that's all that it does. A covenant not to sue. Do you, do you get that or not? It's a, it, it's a negative license. It's a negative license. Exactly right. I'm not giving you the license, but I will not object to it. Exactly. Exactly. It's exactly the point. So some people view that as a license. Some people don't view it as a license. And the important element, I suppose, is this. If you did not want to grant someone a license, and in your jurisdiction you were confident that you weren't grant, going to grant them a license, but rather granted a covenant not to sue if you didn't want to grant them a license. That's the next layer down. But it's, a, it's, an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting dichotomy because it then comes up in the context of exclusive licenses as well as to whether you grant someone exclusive license or whether you're giving them a covenant not to sue or you're, you're granting a covenant not to sue. So it's interesting, this is where I, I start my Latvian excursion. So um, in Latvian copyright law, so in Latvian copyright law, a license constitutes a permission to use a particular work in such a way and in accordance with such provisions as are indicated in the license. So it's very much that permission view of what a license is rather than a covenant not to sue, sue view of what a license is. Um, <clears throat> So getting down to the nitty gritty of what you should consider in the grant clause of a license. And there's a list there as to who the licensor is. It's important, whilst you may think that that's, a, a, that's such a, a basic issue, where you have a corporate structure with no, numerous companies, the vendor may not own the right. And you need to identify that that's the case. Who's the licensee? Again, in the context of you think that that's fairly straightforward, but it may not be, particularly when the licensee wants to build into the structure that their affiliates want to get the rights as well. So there's no, then no contract direct with the affiliates. You may need a direct contract with the affiliates. What type of license is being granted? And they're usually these types, exclusive, sole, non-exclusive, and whether they include or don't include a right to sub-license. What is the intellectual property? What rights are being granted? What is the term of the license? And again, you might think that that's straightforward, but there are issues that impact on that we'll, which we'll go through further. What is the field of license activity? So you may be granting a license to a particular patent for veterinary uses and other parts of the patent for human usage. Um, territory of the license, mm. geographic territory. In Australia, that's significant because you can split up parts of Australia. 
um, how much the license is going to cost and what rights, if any, are reserved to the licensor. Now, that's very significant in the Australian context when you're considering an exclusive license. So what a grant clause might look like after you've considered each of those issues is something like this. <clears throat> the licensor hereby grants the licensee an exclusive, sole, non-exclusive license. So you've got the choice of working out which of those you want, including but not including the right to sub-license. Sub-licensing is a very important element of licensing because it, it, it creates another layer of usage of the right um, in respect of the rights. So, for instance, in the context of a patent, you may not want to grant all the rights. You may want to grant a right to make the product, but not the right to sell the product. You may want to grant all the rights. So it's important to identify um, what, rights are being, uh, what rights are being granted to the relevant intellectual property, patent, copyright, etc., for the, for, the, for the term to undertake the, uh, identify the activity, identify the territory, identify the price, and identify whether there's any reservation of rights. Now, if you can get the grant clause right, you are far more likely to get the commercial deal properly evidenced in a license because all those elements make you think about all the other elements of the license. So if you can get that grant clause right, you'll get the rest of the license more, more than likely right. So we talked before about the differences between exclusive licenses within a jurisdiction. And it's just interesting to compare the meaning of exclusive license in the context of the Patents Act, the Australian Patents Act, and the Australian Copyright Act. So as you can see, the Patents Act says an exclusive licensee means a license, sorry, it means a licensee under a license granted by the patentee, conferring on the licensee or the licensee or persons authorised by the licensee, the right to exploit the invention throughout the patent area to the exclusion of the patentee and all other persons. Whereas in the context of the Copyright Act, exclusive licence means a licence in writing, signed by or on behalf of the owner or prospective owner, there's no concept of prospective owner in a patent. Of copyright authorising the licensee to the exclusion of all other persons to do an act that by virtue of this act, the owner of copyright would but for the licence have the exclusive right to do. An exclusive licensee has the corresponding meaning. Now, um, I know that that's going to take a bit of time to digest, but it's interesting just to think about what the differences are between those two definitions. Anyone pick up anything in particular? I'll go back a slide just to... In writing? And one is not in writing? Uh, sorry, you were saying that there's an act Right, to do an act. Right, if you think about the concept of an act, in the Copyright Act, each act is a separate right. A reproduction right, an adaptation right, publication right. In the Patent Act, exploit encompasses all of those things. Okay. So it's interesting that you focus on writing because in the Patents Act, there's no need for writing for an exclusive license. But there is no one who has a half a brain that doesn't put their exclusive license in writing, okay? Because you need the evidence to, to ensure that if there is a dispute, there is some written document that reflects that. Any other differences, do you think? I'll put you out of your misery. So, there's the comparison. Comparison is writing, no writing, which you picked up. Patentee, owner versus prospective owner. So under the Copyright Act, you can have future copyright ownership. Under the Patents Act, you can't. 
They refer to potential sub-licensees. Under the Copyright Act, they don't. There's a geographical limit in Australia for Patents Act, the patent area. There's no geographic limit under the Copyright Act. The exclusion of the patentee and all other persons. What do you think that means? If I grant you an exclusive license and it says in order to grant an exclusive license, I must exclude the patentee and all other persons. It means that I can't hold it onto the rights. I can't hold onto any right. I can't reserve any right. So if I grant you a right to exploit, I can't hold on to any right in order for it to be an exclusive license. And that's very important, very, very important. And again, the, the concept of the right to exploit, it encompasses everything. Whereas the right to do an act means you can separate out every act in the copyright. And what that means is, in the context of the Australian Act, in the Patents Act, there can only be one exclusive licensee. In the Copyright Act, there can be a number. Okay, that's very significant. So whilst you might think that, you know, that's just between Australia and the Copyright Act, if you look at the UK Act, it gets even more um, interesting. I won't go through the Australian side, but I'll go through the UK side. So it says exclusive license means a license, so that's the same thing, from a proprietor of or an applicant for a patent. So unlike the Australian Act, you've got the opportunity for an exclusive license to have an application, an applicant for a patent to grant an exclusive license. Conferring on the licensee or him or their or persons authorised by him to the exclusion of all other parties, including the proprietor, any right in respect of the invention to which the patent or application relates. And again, just doing that comparison, here you've got the situation of the patentee in Australia is the only one who can grant the exclusive license. In the UK, an applicant for a patent can grant an exclusive license. The other real difference is the right to exploit versus the right to any right. So you can separate out a right to make, sell, etc. That means you can grant many people, you can grant someone an exclusive license to make, exclusive license to sell, an exclusive license to import. And that will still be an exclusive license under UK law. So again, the situation is, under Australian patents law, one exclusive licensee. Under UK patent law, multiple exclusive licensee. And that's significant in terms of the commercial situation. So let's, let me try the Latvian situation. A license should be recognised an exclusive license if the licensee, the recipient party, acquires exclusive rights to use a patent in accordance with the provisions provided for in the license contract, but the licensor retains the right to use the patent insofar as that right has not been transferred to the licensee. So the reservation of right, you can reserve the right under Latvian law. The copyright situation is slightly different in the sense that it gives the right to conduct the activities specified in the license solely to the recipient of the license. Now, we won't go through this now, but there's a difference, at least in common law countries, between the term exclusive and the term sole. So you need to be very careful when you're dealing with that situation in uh, common law countries. So if you compare Australian patent law and Latvian patent law, I won't go through that again, but the comparison is here, what are the differences? Express reference to patentee, geographic limit, right to exploit. Latvian, no express reference to a patentee as a source. No geographic limit. Right to use in accordance with the licence. No exclusion of patentees, multiple potential exclusive licensees. So the Latvian law situation in the patent scene, as far as I can glean, is that you can have multiple exclusive licensees in that situation. Now, that's all interesting to know, but when you 
draft or how do you draft a multi-jurisdiction license that complies with each jurisdiction's definition of an exclusive licensee? So it's very simple if you're dealing with a license in Latvia, but it's much more difficult for a situation when you're dealing with a license that contains Latvia, Australia, Philippines, United States. How do you deal with that? Any, any ideas? But in, in one document? And it, could be. it could be in one document? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any, any other views? Well, I would do several, several agreements, yeah. Could be several agreements. And what would those several agreements contain? Is there something significant about having several agreements? What would happen if there was a breach in one agreement? So you've got an agreement, let's say there are separate agreements, one for the US, one for Australia, one for Latvia, and the Australian agreement license is breached by the licensee. But it doesn't breach the other licensee. Doesn't breach the others. But the original deal was, well, I wanted everything. There could be, or there could be another clause which says default in one means default in the other. Okay. Exactly, the circumstances. So you can have a situation where you have separate agreements. You then have to work out whether you want a severability clause or whether you want a default clause. It depends upon the commercial deal. And um, so a separate license for each jurisdiction with material breach in one jurisdiction giving rise to termination right in that jurisdiction or all jurisdictions, that's one way to do it. And the other way to do it would be one license for all jurisdictions with a separate exclusive licensee grant clause. So there's a separate grant clause for Latvia, separate grant clause for the US, separate grant clause for Australia. Okay, probably gonna need another sip of water before I lose my voice. Do, do any of you know what the significance of being an exclusive licensee is? The one you just discussed, that it's, uh, it's an exclusive license and no one else except the licensee may use uh, whatever is licensed. That's a contractual right. That's a contractual right. But there's a statutory right usually that's given to an exclusive licensee, and that's what I'm trying to f focus on. Specified to good geography? Sorry? Specified to a lot of specific geography? Um, again, that's probably... Um, that's defined in the context of exclusive license, but there are specific rights. That's why it's significant that you are or are not an exclusive licensee. So the significance usually is this. Whilst there may be many and varied rights attached to being an exclusive licensee, the common thread in a lot of le le legislation is an independent right to commence legal proceedings. So you as the patent holder, if you've granted someone an exclusive license, a proper exclusive license, it means that you've also allowed the exclusive licensee to commence infringement proceedings. Now, Usually, a patent holder would not want that to happen. He would want the licensee to reach a threshold because if, it, if you have an unfettered right, if you give the licensee an unfettered right to commence infringement proceedings, then the first thing that'll happen is the patent's gonna be attacked as invalid. Second thing might be that you may have a relationship with whoever that exclusive licensee wants to sue that you don't want them to sue. So usually what happens is there are threshold limits, such as you've got to get um, an opinion of a barrister or something that there's a good case of some sort. It's not just a matter of granting the exclusive licensee an unfettered right to commence legal proceedings.
And that really is the point of the next slide. Most licensors will not want their licensees to have an unfettered right to commence infringement proceedings as those proceedings could give rise to the validity of those rights being challenged by counterclaim. Restrictions and or thresholds are usually included as conditions of the license. So it's important to understand whichever jurisdiction you're in, <coughs> excuse me, what license the statute gives you as an exclusive licensee. And if you as the owner of the relevant right are happy with that, that's fine. But usually giving an exclusive licensee unrestricted, unrestricted right is not commercially sensible from the owner's perspective. So let's just move on. So this is a, an interesting point. Can the terms of a licence, which provides that a licensee is an exclusive licensee, result in that party being an exclusive licensee under the relevant statute where the requirements of an exclusive licensee under that statute are not met? So if you look at the Australian Act, if you look at the Latvian Act, if the requirements of that statute are not met, but the contract says you are an exclusive licensee, what's the status of that licensee? Are they an exclusive licensee or are they not? It depends on the legislation firstly. So the first thing is the legislation. Whatever the contract says is fine because contractually you've got one arrangement, right? Contractually I can say that I grant you an exclusive licence. However, the statute says that in order for me to grant you an exclusive licence, I have to do certain things. There are requirements. So it's important to understand that the answer is no, but all statutes, sorry, but not all statutes define exclusive licensee in a proscriptive manner or at all. And in those jurisdictions, if a party is referred to as an exclusive licensee, it may still get the rights. So the important thing to understand is this, a separation of the contractual rights from the statutory rights. So we go to a sole license and uh, it's important to understand what a sole license is because we talked about the concept of sole. Usually it's a license that grants rights to one party with the owner retaining rights to use for its own purposes and license. Okay, that's usually what a sole license is. It's far better though if the sole license only relates to the use of the licensor. That is the only thing that the sole license uh, deals with is a retention of right to use the license for their own purposes. Because if they grant a license, if they retain a right to grant licenses, it means there's competition in the marketplace and there'll be confusion in the marketplace as to these parties that have license rights. So when you use the word sole, be careful, it's not the same as exclusive. That's right, you are one of many, but in order to protect you, the situation of the licensees, you say the only right you have as the sole licensor, as the licensor, is the right to have a use of the patent for your own purposes, not to license others. You need to exclude that licensing right, absolutely. So then we get on to what is a non-exclusive license. And really it's where the licensor reserves the right to grant other licenses and retains the right itself. And that's very much like the uh, Latvian copyright law. So the key points in the context of licensing are we've only dealt with a very small range of issues relating to licensing. Don't assume that what applies to one type of intellectual property in a jurisdiction 
applies equally to other types of intellectual property in that jurisdiction or in other jurisdictions. Clearly understand the requirements for being an exclusive licensee in each jurisdiction and that exclusive license is sought to be created. And licensing in multiple jurisdictions obviously creates its own issues. So um, I think that ends the licensing scenario. We then move on to assignment and So effectively an assignment's a sale. That's all that it is, it's a sale. But it's a transfer of a legal title. Earlier on I mentioned to you the concept of legal and equitable. I don't want to confuse you, but you can also have a transfer of an equitable right, not a legal right. It's transfer of a legal title or ownership to the relevant IP that is property in various jurisdictions. So assignments are referred to as transfers in Latvia and Canada. And in the context of Australia, at least, a patent assignment has to be in writing, signed by or on behalf of the assignor and the assignee. Copyright assignment must be in writing, signed by the assignor. Assignor is the person who sells. Assignee is the person that receives. Registered trademark does not have those requirements, but does require a document that establishes the title to the trademark of the, license, of the assignee. And the registered design must be in writing signed by or on behalf of the assignor and the assignee. So again, you can see that in the context of Australia, at least, there are different requirements for each and applications for registration are not property and therefore are dealt with differently. Now, again, the Australian situation is somewhat different. It's useful just to go through an example. In Australia, a patent can be assigned for a place or part of the patent area. So Australia is a big country, obviously. You can assign for Sydney and not the rest of Australia. That can cause its own problems. Copyright is the one that has the most flexibility. May be assigned for a place in or part of Australia and may be limited in any way, including by period or acts. And there was an example that I gave you earlier on where we talked about exclusive license. But this is an interesting one. So Registered trademarks may be assigned for some of the goods or services for which registration is obtained. So let's assume it's obtained for coffee and tea. Let's assume you have a trademark for coffee and tea. You can separate those two out, but may not be assigned for part of the location for which registration is obtained. So you can't separate out a location. The others you can. Now, if you wanted to keep, if you as the seller wanted to keep the rights to a geographic area in Australia, what might you do? You can't assign because you can't assign for part of Australia. Is there something that you might be able to do in order to retain rights? So if I wanted to sell my trademarks to you, but to keep the trademarks for all of Melbourne, what do you think could be done there? The buyer should issue me some kind of license to use it within Melbourne. Reverse license? Well, that's, that's close. That's close. That's very good. Because what, what then happens is this. I, as the seller, will sell you all the trademarks. But you, as the buyer, have to license me back. Yes. Okay? So that's the way that it works in the context of that, that trademark situation. So we then move on to registered designs, and registered designs may be assigned for part of a place, etc. So it's just important to understand that there's, um, there are those geographic limits. Then going on to the effect of failing to record an assignment or a transfer in a patent register. Um, a transfer of a patent that has not been recorded in Canada, this is a Canadian situation, is void against a subsequent transferee if the transfer to the subsequent transferee has been recorded. So if, I'm, if I've sold my patent to you 
but you haven't recorded it, you haven't recorded that transfer, and then someone else comes along and records their interest, their interest will be superior to your interest. Likewise, until the fixing of change of the owner in the patent register, the successor of the right may not exercise the right resulting from the acquisition of a patent against a third party. So under Latvian law, you've got to register the right, otherwise you can't commence infringement proceedings. So the important part about all that is that when you're a purchaser of these rights, you've got to, and this reference to the BSA is the bill, uh, business sale agreement. Above is important to remember the context of post-completion acts to be undertaken by a purchaser. When you purchase these rights, you've got to register them. Otherwise, you're going to be um, at risk of all those sorts of issues that I've just mentioned there. So, assignment, make sure strict and timely compliance <coughs> with assignment and transfer requirements in the jurisdiction where the transfer of title is sought to be affected. Be aware of the restrictions and entitlements of assignment in the relevant jurisdiction. So we move on to spin-out companies and uh, startup companies. Um, any idea what the difference is between a startup company and a spin-out company? Already existing, yep. Yes, and then uh, the business sees that some part of it may be split as a separate say, company project, and that's a spin out. Start up is some just a new business, yeah. So a spin out comes out of a host organization. So there may be a university, there may be a corporation, they take one part of the business out, and it's called a spin out. Startup um, is just a new business. But, but the important thing is this, that in the context of the issues, largely the issues are the same, but you need to understand that the terminology does result in something different, okay? Um, what are the most common resources needed to establish and operate a spin-out company? Now, I won't put you through the agony of going through these, they're the ones that are usually the ones that, that are needed. And uh, obviously, the one, the one that I'll be focusing on, on is intellectual property. But, um, and I'm using the term spin out to cover both a startup and, uh, and a spin out company. So you need money, you need intellectual property, you need operational personnel, you need management personnel. Now, the experience that I've had is that in the context of operational personnel, scientists make great scientists, but they make bad managers. And so you usually don't get the scientists to manage the operation. Relevant, relevant physical items, physical space, and presence on the internet. So all of those sorts of things are usually required when you need to establish a spin-out company or a start-up company. Now, spin-out company intellectual property. So the issues that come up in that context are what IP will be required at the outset, who owns or is entitled to grant rights to that intellectual property, how will that IP be made available, what rights will be granted, what price will be charged, and how will IP developed within or for the spin-out company be dealt with in relation to ownership, use rights, benefit sharing, etc. So we'll explore all the, the issues that are in blue. We won't explore the issues that, that are in, in black. The important part about who owns or is entitled to grant the rights to the intellectual property, usually the problem that arises is someone within an organisation wants to get out of that organisation and start up a company. They will need intellectual property or may need intellectual property in order to do that. The issue then is what intellectual property will be needed. The issue then is they may allege that they own the intellectual property. So you've got the issue of, let's say it's a, a university, a university and there's a researcher. They may allege that they own the intellectual property. 
So you've got, the, you've got to resolve the situation between the employer and the employee. And there, therefore that means that you have to have a good system to record um, ownership rights. How the intellectual property will be made available at the outset, license, we'll go through that in, in a little bit later. In fact, we'll go through that on the next slide. So, any, any thoughts about how intellectual property ought to be made available to a spin-out company? Well, you've got all, all those options there at least. Bought? Yeah, you, you're assigning the rights. We are bought. And are you perhaps thinking about a license of some sort? Because this new company is just new. It's you know going to start up a business that's that either might be successful or may not be successful. And you, as the host organisation, may still require to use it. It does depend upon the economic value, but it also, I think, depends upon... I think one of the things that, that you need to think about is what is the aim of the spin-out company? What is the aim, ultimately, of the spin-out company? And usually most spin-out companies, the focus is listing on the stock market or a, or, or, or a buyout of some sort. So you need to think about what that focus is and therefore are you going to transfer all your rights to whatever it might be on the speculation that this spin-out company might be a success? Are you, are you happy to assign or are you more likely to licence? Yeah, um, so again, it's a licensing arrangement of some sort. It's a licensing arrangement of some sort. So, um, I mean, all these options exist. So you can have an exclusive license so long as milestones are reached. Now, I'm not inclined to grant exclusive licenses at an early stage. A non-exclusive or sole license converted to an exclusive or a license um, or rights assigned upon milestones being reached. All of these elements in the spin-out company are milestone-driven. If you achieve a milestone, maybe we'll give you something more. So originally, you may grant a non-exclusive licence, let's say, for a particular field. If you reach this milestone, we'll convert this licence to an to a exclusive licence. If you reach another milestone, we may convert it to an assignment. So you need to think about all those sorts of options, bearing in mind what the ultimate focus of the spin-out company is. And um, so assuming that it's going to be a licence of some sort, you need to think about all these elements. Exclusive, non-exclusive. Will the holder of the rights want retention of any rights for its activities as the host organisation? So for instance, it may be that if there's a patent of some sort, it's quite happy to license veterinary use but wants to continue human use. It may, um, the spin-out company, is it seeking or likely to have the ability to cover all the applications of intellectual property? Most unlikely. Is it capable of division into fields of activity? What jurisdictions does the IP cover and what jurisdictions does the spin-out company have the ability to cover? So for instance, I mean, I've seen situations where spin-out companies have been given worldwide rights, but they have absolutely no ability 
to be able to um, work on a worldwide basis. They have rights that they can exploit in Australia or the US. But the question about what jurisdiction can they cover is a very important question. Does the spin-out company need a sub-licensing right? Should the license be milestone or performance-based? And we've talked earlier on about the fact that there are advantages in it being milestone or performance-based. Now, the ultimate question is this, maximising the spin-out company's IP position on exit. So if the spin-out company needs the intellectual property at the end of the day in order to have a successful IPO, then it may be that it's an assignment at the end of the day. An exclusive licence may suffice. If it's a trade sale, that is, there's a buyer in the industry, what does that buyer need in terms of intellectual property? All those sorts of things would evolve or could evolve. And here's an example of how that licence or those licensing arrangements could in fact work. One could be that the spin-out company owns and has use rights and benefit sharing rights. The host organisation has use rights and benefit sharing rights. A third party has commercialisation rights or it's treated in the same manner as the intellectual property that's originally contributed to the spin-out company. Now, I don't want to over-confuse you with this, but um, the issue is, do you want the ultimate holding of the intellectual property in one company so that it's easily dealt with at the end of the day rather than it having bits and pieces? And usually there are administrative advantages in one company owning and when the milestones are achieved, if, if it's an exclusive licence, grant them an exclusive licence. If it's an assignment, assign, etc. But the important point is this, that the focus is usually, when you're dealing with the exit strategy, it's a capital gain strategy. Okay? What the um, host organisation wants is that when the company is listed, when the company is sold, there's a capital gain for the investors. And that's the end game. Um, I've come to an hour and probably about halfway through. Um, halfway, so you haven't said next 10 minutes. Next 10 minutes? Okay, I'll, I'll do 10 minutes. Um, so really in the context of um, spin-out companies, the focus in relation to intellectual property is to maximise its high position on exit, really. The important thing to understand in that context is that ownership can be unbundled to suit the requirements of the deal, but there can be merit to simplifying ownership of all intellectual property. You saw that earlier on I talked about use rights, benefit sharing rights, they're not ownership rights, so you don't necessarily need ownership. You can split ownership into all sorts of other things, and that unbundling relationship um, is a significant component of it. Now, um, let's see how best to do this. I'll just make the simple point about this that. Um, Collaborations and joint ventures, unlike partnerships, are single project focused. Okay, that's the important element, single project focused. And for that purpose, you may need background intellectual property and the result of that collaboration or joint venture will be project intellectual property. And again, you have to work out how do you contribute that background intellectual property we talked about that in the context of spin-out companies. Um, you've got all the options that I've mentioned up there. Who is the background intellectual property contributed to? If you have an unincorporated joint venture, they license each other. If you've got A, B and C, A will license B, A will license C, B will license A, C will license A. So there are circular licenses that are granted to that intellectual property. They could, however, 
establish a separate corporate entity. So ABC, establish D, and ABC, license D. So that's the incorporated joint venture model. Um, here, the important element to focus on is that the focus is not on a capital gain situation. The focus is on creating a new product, a new service, something that the participants will share, will want the benefit of, and something that the participants can't do on their own. They haven't got the size or the scale to do on their own. They haven't got the expertise to do on their own. So ownership of the project intellectual property, the PIP, there are all sorts of ways to determine ownership of the project IP in the collaboration. One could be that the outcome re relates to the party's background intellectual property. One could be that it's whoever reduces the idea to practice first, that is based on their employee. One could also be re where the relevant work is conducted and in whose laboratory it's conducted. And one could be simply co-ownership. You don't think about it at all, it's co-ownership. The issue about co-ownership though is, what are the shares? Is it 50-50, is it one third? Is it based on the value contribution that you make to that joint venture? And there are other options that I'll consider a little bit later on. Um, I just wanted to um, mention the co-ownership rights in Australia and the US, which are very different. In Australia, subject to any agreement to the contrary, a co-owner of a patent is not entitled to grant a license without the consent of the other co-owners. Not. In the US, is entitled to grant a license without the consent of the other co-owners and is not required to account to the other co-owners. Now, what are the implications of that, do you think? In Australia, you need the consent of the co-owners. In the US, you don't need the consent of the co-owners. On the one hand. On the other hand, there are more licenses in the US. And one license, or so if you and I are co owners, you license to X, I license to Y, X and Y are competitors, it poses a very, very difficult situation. So there's a freedom that has its own problems, and the freedom that exists in the US is not a freedom that exists in Australia, but it creates a stalemate. The point, though, is this. The law regulating co-ownership varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, so be careful about choosing co-ownership in a multi-jurisdiction collaboration or joint venture. Um, I just wanted to perhaps... I don't, won't finish this off, but... These are the sorts of issues that you have to deal with in the collaboration or joint venture. The nature, of the, joint the nature of the ownership, joint tenants, tenants in common. The proportion of ownership, how do you determine that? 50-50, based on value. What's the revenue sharing? What are the use rights? What are the licensing rights, the sale rights? The selection of professional advisors, legal proceedings. How do you initiate legal proceedings? Cost sharing rights, etc. All of this comes down to this, that co-ownership as a default arrangement should not be considered as the optimal option. Because if you go for co-ownership, there are all sorts of issues that you need to think about. And that's the next slide. Co-ownership should never be viewed as a default option. Now, I'll end on one particular point, which I think is of interest, uh, and it comes a bit later on, after the mergers and acquisitions section. So, um, when you're doing a due diligence for a merger or, or a license, you've got to consider the situation of the validity or invalidity of royalties that are sought to be imposed post the expiration of a patent, okay? So the patent expires, and if the license says the royalties continue in some way, then in the US, that right is not enforceable. 
if, if the acquisition that you're looking at is dependent upon that royalty income, then that's a problem. If you, as a licensor, are aware of that situation, that is before all this has happened, you're aware that post-patent term royalties are not enforceable, then what you need to do is to attach another right. Patent expires, trade secrets can be another element of that. So if there's a 6% royalty for patents, the patent expires, there's a 5% royalty for trade secrets. There's another property right that you attach it to. Okay? So that's the answer. But when you're in a situation of a due diligence and you're looking at what the license says, if you have a situation in the US where there are post patent term royalties, they will not be enforced. In Canada, it's different. Post patent term royalties will be enforced. In Australia, post patent term royalties, if there is a if if a patent expires, if an Australian patent expires, that license can be terminated by anybody, by the licensor or by the licensee. Now that's significant, again, if you're looking at an acquisition um, situation and you've got a worldwide situation, let's say, that has licensed Australian patents, US patents, Latvian patents. And in that patent license, there is one Australian patent and it's terminated. That whole license can then be terminated on three months' notice. Um, key conclusions. IP can be a significant factor in commercial transactions, but not always. I mean, you don't need to overstate what the importance of intellectual property is. Understand the fundamentals of IP and proactively adapt to the deal and the jurisdictions of the deal. Cost savings and efficiencies will result. So as I mentioned to you at the beginning, Transaction costs can be significant. If you know what the law is, if you know what your options are, then those cost savings can occur. Consider intellectual property as part of the commercial deal and not as an afterthought or as a separate silo. Again, cost savings will occur. I'll give you an example of that quickly. And that example is when I was involved with the situation of establishing an IP holding company for tax reasons. We were brought in at a later stage to deal with the IP. Whatever the tax people said couldn't be done. Okay? So you need to understand that intellectual property needs to be part of the commercial transaction, not an afterthought. Um, and lastly, obviously, a very small range of issues have been considered in this presentation, and that's before the implications of AI begin. And good luck with AI, because I'm not going to be around. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam, for this interactive type of lecture. And uh, I believe that there is a time for the questions sure. and answers. Sure. And fortunately, I have to tell you that I have to leave it because I have another engagement in five minutes. Right? So I will leave you alone. Thank you. And, uh, this, uh, I will write an email to you about the meeting tomorrow or somewhere. Okay, okay. So thanks very much again. And, uh, Thank you. And I, I believe it will be also the time for the, the interaction with you. you spend some sure, time sure, with sure. Okay. sure. But the floor is open to the questions, comments, and so on. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon. from University of Latvia, physicist. Um, is there a way to command this intellectual property use in a negative way? So, for example, it has some kind of thing, technical thing, like a process or solution for technology, but this thing implies that if I publish it, if I start to use it, it is uh, like a, it results in a containable situation that everybody can. Like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I see much more trouble. Patented than to just release it in public. So, is there a way uh, to block this intellectual property uh, licensing? Uh, everybody into well, I, I, I'm not exactly sure of what you're asking, but, but I'll, I'll try and answer as best I can. So, in the context of patents, a patent has to be novel, new. Okay? So, if you publish before you've lodged the application, 
the patent will not be valid. Forever, yeah. Yep. The issue then is whether you want to keep that information as a trade secret. Okay. If you do, then you've got to properly keep it as a trade secret. And that means if you disclose it to someone else, there's got to be a contractual relationship of some sort. There's got to be the processes to deal with that. Unfortunately, I didn't get the time to deal with that. But the, but the, the dichotomy is patent or trade secret. I don't know whether I've answered your question, but um, as best I can. Patent, trade secret, or probably I release something that is for public use or good for everybody. So that's oh no, no. But if if you want to if you want to disclose it for the public use, then by all means, then by all means. But then cannot, but then you won't have a patent. And there cannot be the situation that somebody like uh, acts as a company. No, no, no. If if you've released it, mm -hmm. someone else may lodge an application, but that application will be unsuccessful because prior to his application, it would have been released. It would have been published. Ah, yep. Down the back. Yes, I was uh, thinking uh, in the slide, uh, you showed that uh, the patent, uh, after its expiration, uh, it could be um, commercialized as a trade secret and perceived uh, royalties, yes? What if uh, the company doesn't want to disclose uh, the invention and keep it as a trade secret? Can it also have commercialized uh, the, the, the trade secret? Sorry, what I was talking about in the context of the US was because of the US, um, there's no post-term validity, royalties can't be charged. What usually the licensor does is if it wants to continue the license, it says that notwithstanding that the patent has expired, you are still getting the benefit of trade secret rights. Now, there have to be trade secret rights that are granted. It's not just something made up. No, you have a contract. Yeah, but that's in the contract. But um, it's not as if um, I could make up that there is a trade secret. There have to be trade secrets. Yeah. I, I hope I've answered your yeah, question. Somehow, yeah. My question was different than what was in the slide. That's why I was asking uh, in which manner the trade secret can be uh, commercialized. In, in which, sorry? In, in which way it can be commercialized? Which? The trade secret? Yes. Just the normal... So whatever the license says, mm -hmm. if there are trade secrets, if the licensor has separated out patent rights, trade secret rights, Patent rights, I, you, you, you the licensee pay me, whatever it is, 6%. For the trade secrets, you pay me 5%. When the patent expires, you no longer pay me the 6%, you continue to pay me the 5%. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Just uh, one more question regarding the gentleman's uh, situation with the patents. Uh, I just imagined that, uh, say, in the field of software, there is specific type of licenses, these general public licenses that permit you to use uh, the code or, and some of them even make you to make your code. Open. That's an open source licensing, so yeah. Is there, to your knowledge, is there something uh, similar in the field of patents? No, not, not, not particularly. I mean, I'm aware of open source licensing. The, um... there's, there's, of course, there's not this uh, thing that you have to make or whatever you base on patents uh, publicly available, but uh, some uh, just general... I'm, I'm not aware of it. I mean, I know some um, institutions do grant open licenses. I think the University of New South Wales for instance, has a program where certain of its patents are available, but beyond the particular institution, I'm not aware of it being of the same regime as the open source licensing regime. Mm -hmm. Hi. So, very generally speaking, so what are your thoughts? How can AI influence intellectual property rights? So, what can be this? Uh... Well, well, I think the main consequence is going to be who, 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 who owns the right. 
I mean, in Australia recently, there's been, been a court case. So originally in the federal court, the judge of first instance said that um, a computer could own the right. In the, in the full federal court, it was overturned. The only person, the only party that can own is a human being. In the high court, that was confirmed. Most of the courts around the world have said that only a human being can be an inventor. Okay, but the law, I mean, the law is going to have to adapt because AI is here and somehow it's going to have to be dealt with. Any other questions? Just, just a thought regarding this AI. Could it be that uh, this presence of AI, as we know it now, because it, it will also develop, but as we know it now, it's generally a great compilator of already available knowledge, the technology as it is. So basically, it replaces something that humans have been doing, naming it creative job, which is not really purely creative. It's something that they do by combination. And uh, this uh, advent of the AI may, it might rise the criteria for creativity, especially in the copyrights, to, 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 for the work to be acknowledged as a Good. work of creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think it's that's an issue that's been um, mentioned in patents, because the the concept of the inventor in the concept of patents that the level of invention may have to rise in order to deal with AI. It's more in that context than in the copyright context, because certainly in the context of of copyright at the moment, originality is the issue. It has to originate from the author, and that's all that has to be done. But the question of who the author is, is the big question. Um, in Australia, the situation is a human being has to be the author. The law may evolve to deal with computerised issues, but it hasn't got there yet. Actually, two jurisdictions have New Zealand, and the UK. If you look up their copyright laws, both of those have. I happen to be at the board of the Inventor Society in Latvia, and all those inventors, uh, they, what they do is they start with Latvia, this patent office, pull this patent in Latvia, and not only that in Europe or somewhere else, it's also a little less costly for Latvia. But is there a way? Uh, to kind of put a shoe in the doors for the whole world, if there is an option like this, like not to go in Latvia after this in Europe. So well, you, you money and time, so. yeah, sure, yeah, sure. All, all you need to do is to lodge a patent application, get a priority date. Certainly in, in Australia, you have a 12 month period within which to lodge the final application. And during that period of time, you try and get investors to say, look, this is a fantastic invention. In order to protect it worldwide, I need all this money. So the application, the priority date of the application is crucial. And what is, what is this allusion in any place in Australia, Latvia, in any office, yeah? Yep, no? yep. Yeah. Anything else? And it is defined by the time 12 months, yeah? Um, I'm, I'm in Australia. In Australia, it, it's about the same. It's about the same period everywhere else. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much.